Hey, we're back. We're live at the 11 o'clock block on a given Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech. More specifically, this is ThinkTech Tech Talks. We're talking about technology today, and we're talking about the telescope, TMT. <clears throat> They've been trying to get their permits in order and come and build for 15 years in Hawaii. Uh, and they promised, uh, initially, I was there at a, at a meeting uh, before the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, where they said they were going to dot every I and cross every T, and they've worked hard to do that. However, there is uh, resistance, and that resistance has existed and is growing. And as you know from the newspapers uh, and online, and for that matter, the national press, there's a lot of people who don't want to see this happen. And that seems to be growing. So today to discuss the matter, we have the uh, interim director of the Institute for Astronomy at UH, which is uh, you know, directly related and involved in astronomy in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, that's Bob McLaren. And uh, we have Holly Lindsay. She's an educator interested in the subject as well. Welcome to the show, Bob and Holly. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. Can, Bob, can you give us a snapshot of what it is, this telescope, and where we are on it? Yes. Um, 30 meter telescope, uh, as the name suggests, uh, is a large, much larger telescope than the, the current generation of telescopes, roughly three times larger in diameter. So that means nine times larger in light collecting power. Uh, that has uh, two advantages. One, uh, you can look at fainter objects, much fainter objects, and that means objects that are further away. And also, because of the larger size, it can also distinguish uh, more clearly objects that are close together. And that's particularly important when we're looking at planets around other stars, so-called exoplanets. So what does this telescope offer um, to, the, um, to Hawaii, to science in Hawaii, and to the Hawaii community? Well, starting first with the science, um, it can uh, study things that we simply can't do well with the existing class of telescopes. I think the exoplanet uh, application is the easiest for the viewers to grasp, but one of the main areas of astronomy nowadays is to look at planets around other stars. It's a recently developed field, uh, 30 years or so ago, uh, we weren't even sure there were planets around other stars. Yeah, I grew right? up with only nine, right. and now there were only eight of those in our own solar system. People always suspected there were, right. but there wasn't any proof. Now we know about thousands of them. So now the attention is, okay, are there any that are like Earth? And how much like Earth, and how many of them? And of course, the follow-on question there, what's the likelihood that life could have developed on those planets? Well, in order to do a good job of researching that, you need a bigger telescope than the current generation for the two reasons that I suggested earlier. The exoplanets are really faint, right? And they're small and they're far away, so you need a big telescope to see them at all. You certainly need a big telescope to study their properties. The other thing is that these planets are quite close to their parent star, and the whole thing is far away. So you need to be able to separate a really faint planet from its great big bright star right beside it. And that requires you to be able to separate things that are close together on the sky, and for that you also need a big telescope. So the goal is to, among other things, with the 30 meter telescope, is to uh, look at exoplanets that we know are there from other techniques that other telescopes have found, and then be able to actually get a picture of the planet separate from the star, and then to be able to analyze the light from the planet and see if there's an atmosphere, what gases might be in the atmosphere, and if there are uh, fingerprints that might indicate the presence of life. So that's the, that's the real sort of holy grail of that area of astronomy, mm -hmm. and it's one that the 30-meter telescope is uniquely capable of pursuing. Mm -hmm. Is it true that the TMT can actually extend to the dark ages of the universe? I mean, past where yeah. Hubble went uh, and studied? Well, that's the other end of the, dist the, oh, dis okay. the distance scale in this. Um, the exoplanets are, in astronomy terminology, they're, they're nearby. I mean, they're next-door neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, they're still a vast distance away, but in, mm -hmm. in the overall scheme of things, they're, they're nearby. At the other end of the distance scale is the things, the most distant objects that we can see in the universe. And, of course, 
when you're looking at those, they're very far away, and you're looking at them as they were way back in time. So that's when stars were born, in other when words. Stars were born okay. and galaxies were born. And the underlying assumption in astronomy and in cosmology is that the universe is more or less homogeneous. And so when we're looking at the way this distant area was 13 billion years ago, we're also seeing the way we were 13 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. That's because there's a fundamental assumption that you make that basically the universe is the same everywhere at a, at a given time in its evolution. So we're looking, when you look back in time, you're seeing the galaxies form, uh, stars form, the very first generation, and we presume from that that we're also seeing how our universe formed, uh, our local part of the universe formed that long ago. And again, you need those same two characteristics. You're looking way back in time, things are really just very far away, they're faint, so you need a big telescope to collect enough light. And the objects are close together, and you want to be able to see detail. And again, you need the big telescope in order to get what astronomers call angular resolution, right. the ability to, to see things close together and to see fine detail. We have some slides, Bob. Yeah. Uh, let's go through sure. them and help people understand what, what, is, yeah. what is contemplated. Yep. Okay, so this is... Uh, this is an aerial photograph of the summit area of Mauna Kea, looking from uh, sort of the southwest direction, so towards the northeast. Um, and you'll see in the middle section, you'll see the current complement of telescopes there. There are about 10 of them in, actually in operation. Astronomy, I should point out, has been on Mauna Kea for over 50 years. Okay, so it's not this development. And the last, the most recent telescopes to be put there was over 25 years ago. Um, so the telescope that's on the left is the proposed TMT. Yes. It's not actually there. It's what it would look like after construction. Right. That's yeah. been photoshopped in. Right. right? <laughs> so the first thing you see is it's not in the summit area. The true summit of the Mauna Kea lower. is in the background uh, right. beyond all the telescopes. So the cinder cone, or uh, Pu'u, on the right edge is Pu'upoleahu. Um, and then the 30 meter telescope is in the foreground on the lower left um, at a location called 13 North. And that's a, a name that that location was given in the 1960s. Because when the university first got involved in astronomy on Mauna Kea, and they were looking for a place to put the original, the initial research telescope there, they surveyed a number of sites. And one of the sites that they surveyed was at the uh, north part of the, of the uh, area and also at a 13,000 foot elevation. So that's called 13 North. Mm -hmm. So that, the 30 meter telescope is at the site that was uh, tested back in about 1965. It wasn't the site that was ultimately selected for uh, the U8, what eventually became the UH 2.2 meter telescope. Mm -hmm. But it was a belt site and you could see the the, the Jeep trail that goes out to it is the original, original oh. trail. You spent but, some time up there. You worked at the Canada France Telescope. Yeah, I came to Y in 1982, uh, expecting to be just here one year. It was a sabbatical from the University of Toronto in Canada, where I was on the faculty. I ended up staying at CFHT for eight years, doing one thing and another. And then at that time, there were not any permanent positions for astronomers there. Uh, UH was on the point of the development of the telescope on Mauna Kea in the 1990s. So I, I worked with the permitting and the, arrange, the university's arrangements for the second Keck telescope, uh, Subaru, um, Gemini, and the submillimeter array. Wow. Luckily, there were no controversies during that period. Uh, no, there, there actually were a few, but not anything like today, mm -hmm. and not the same issue. I right. think the, the whole astronomy thing started as a result of the Hilo tidal wave. I mean, the tidal wave that hit Hilo in the 1960s, isn't that correct? And they were looking for economic, viable economic alternatives because mm -hmm. the, we were devastated. So, you know, they, they never, I think, expected astronomy to take off as it has um, and become a global leader in Hawaii. It just happened. And um, it's the ideal place in the world. Everybody agrees on that. That's one thing we can agree on. Well, Holly, you know, it's very technical. It's uh, engineering, it's science, it's astronomy, mm -hmm. it's the heavens. 
And I, I guess you could say that, um, you know, we have a, a very distant relationship with the heavens. <laughs> oh, well, I think all of this... Um, and the, question you know, is, yeah. the question is, why should we, the people of Hawaii, care about astronomy? I'll ask you both that mm -hmm. question. Uh -huh. Why should we care? Why should we be involved? Okay. Why should we want to support astronomy and science at the top of Mauna Kea? Well, my doctorate is in administration, planning, and social policy, very akin to what um, uh, is taken for the directorship of any of these astro uh, astronomical observatories or in an educator environment. So what I look at is, I've heard people say this has nothing to do with astronomy or science, you know, we have nothing against you, we support it. But I hear others saying this has nothing to do with the cultural significance when you have to weigh it against the science. But to me, <laughs> having dealt with many policy issues, and I'm sure Bob too, you, we are the melting pot here in Hawaii. We really are a melting pot. So in this pot, all of these issues are important to one person or the other or to all of us. It should be important to all of us. We should understand all sides. It's culture. It's religion. It's art. It's practice. It's who we are as a people and who we want to be in the future. We want science. We want technology. We want our children to have an opportunity to study all these things. They want to study Hawaiian language? Yes. If they want to study hula? Yes. If they want to study astronomy or biology or marine science? Yes. Why can't we give them these opportunities for everything? Because that's how we will expand and grow. Most of all, that's how we'll discover and explore. We all know the Polynesian history is illustrious in discovery, exploring. If they had stayed back from where they came yeah, from, look at like, the hukulea. yeah, like, you know, we it's all, all about yeah. discovery. It's mm -hmm. all we all celebrate hukulea. So, Bob, you know, what is what does it mean to IFA? What does it mean to the Institute for Astronomy? What does it mean to the university? What does it mean to you know, all the astronomers who are at IFA and who are on the mountain now. Well, um, IFA was developed uh, in sort of a symbiotic relationship with the development of the mountaintop observatory, Haleakala and, and Mauna Kea. So a number of people at the Institute have essentially devoted their career to developing a mountain and developing a faculty to make good use. So oh, that's it's um, it's really central to what the IFA has been and mm -hmm. what it is today. Um, I think uh, the assuming that that one uh, is supportive of astronomy in general in Hawaii, and not everyone is, and maybe we should talk about that um, because I think it's a, an important factor in in trying to sort out the thinking. Uh, but assuming that, that you are, then um, you can't just stand still, right? Uh, you have to move to the next stage of telescopes, and that's what the 30 meter represents. It is the next generation that gives us the capability to move beyond. It's like all science, isn't it? All science yes. all engineering, right. it moves, and it moves quicker these days than ever. Yes. And you have to follow yeah. it, or, or, or mm -hmm. you can't. This is like cell phones. I hate changing my cell phone, but I know it's necessary. Yeah. If something becomes obsolete, you have to go to the next step. Nothing in technology yeah. lasts forever. We're going to take yeah. a short break. Sure. Bob and Holly, uh, we're gonna, just uh, for a minute, we'll be right back after that. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, 
You name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Okay, we're back with Bob McLaren. He's the interim director of uh, the uh, IFA. Institute for Astronomy at U University of Hawaii, Manoa. Uh, and we have Holly Lindsay, an educator. So Bob, one of the things you mentioned before the break was that um, there were some controversies about the telescopes on top of Mauna Kea years ago, but it was different. Can you, you know, tell the difference between what happened then and what's happening now? Yeah, it's the issues that were involved and also the intensity. I think you know, before I arrived, during the 1980s, um, there were concerns about um, the aesthetics and appearance of putting these uh, man-made devices on the mountain. There were also environmental concerns, uh, endangered species, uh, and actually a lot of the uh, worries then act were not related to the summit of the mountain, but actually the mid-level facility, mm -hmm. which is in the critical habitat of the Palila bird. Um, Later, there was concern developed for a particular insect called the vacuo bug, mm -hmm. a very uh, a, a seed bug that's adapted to high altitude um, and uses the cinder slope of the pu'u's as its habitat. Mm -hmm. It moves up and down in the cinder to adjust to reach the temperature that it wants to be at at any given time. Um, fortunately, we understand that now, and we know how to. Uh, to minimize the impact on the vacuum bug. For a while, it was being considered for listing as a, an endangered species. It's now totally off the list, thanks to the efforts of the Office of Mauna Kea Management. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer anywhere near a uh, situation of being an endangered species. And that's because of the good work that the university has done in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. There's a huge amount of attention paid to these issues, which for one reason or another, uh, weren't given the attention uh, that they should have been from the beginning. Now, that's all changed. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the when I the, the work I did with the telescopes during the 90s, there was still concern about the environmental issues, about the aesthetics, but not the spiritual aspect that we're hearing that's primary today. Nothing like that. That's new. So it certainly would be wrong to think that the current telescopes there were built. Uh, over the objections, the kind of objections that we're hearing today. Right. That's simply not true. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I can explain why that is. Well, but I think that's, back in the, the 80s, thing. my take on it was that only a very few uh, practitioners could even make it to the summit because it was papu for the rest of the beyonds. You had to be a chief or a priest or a li'i. I believe the last uh, uh, li'i was Queen Emma. It took six hours to get up, and I'm mm -hmm. sure this is long to come down. It's not, a, it's not an easy place to get no, to. No, and you can have pulmonary edema up there. Yeah. Well, children what, should not be feet. going to the summit. Mm -hmm. uh, not I think everybody can go up there. No. 13 years and, uh, and below, lower, forget it. You're going to have a brain aneurysm or whatever. Yeah. You're going to yeah. have um, altitude sickness, and I think they've, they've already reported a couple of people just at the 8,000-foot level have suffered from altitude if you have heart conditions, respiratory conditions, you're a kapuna, if you're over... But but did you want to add something to Bob's thoughts about why this was important um, and um, why people should care about it, both oh, academically I, I and otherwise? I think the worst thing is to be apathetic and not care about either side and say, I'm on the fence, I agree with both, is okay. But you also need, everybody has a brain. If we didn't, we would give up, right? So you have a choice to become an informed person. And that's the only reason why I'm here. You know, I have my beliefs, but I'll keep them to myself. But it's up to us to disseminate true information. The amount of false um, information just to win or to lose or whatever, to make somebody else you know, lose, it's not about winning and losing. We are all going to be both. Let's I think it's going to be lose-lose. Okay. We can be win-win. Yes. Slides so people understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the best. You, you mentioned earlier, it's the best site on Earth. That is all things considered, I think, 
uh, it's probably, arguably, the best site anywhere on Earth. Uh, and so, um, in some respects, it's kind of a, a resource or a gift to the whole world oh, yeah. it's so for precious. providing the best uh, site, the best window on the universe mm -hmm. from the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And people might want to think, you know, whether uh, we have, as Hawaiian, whether we have some obligation to mm -hmm. make this available to all of the people of the world for this purpose. That's in, one of the in, in fundamental way questions of here, because yeah, there are some I think people who don't want to do that. Well, I'm not sure they don't want to do it. I, uh, what I would like to talk about is that, you know, let me say, I think that ultimately the the use of the mountaintops for astronomy, in some sense, has to be a community decision. Um, you say that, but we, we had 15 years of litigation yeah, about it. Yeah, I know. And, and ultimately, the Supreme Court made it clear uh, that this project legally could proceed. Um, so now, do we have another uh, political process? And who votes in that process? Yeah. Is there a vote? Is there a governmental decision-making process? When you say a community decision, how do you measure what the community feels? There are a lot of people that are not protesting, but they don't say anything. Yeah. How do you how do you get their views into the mix? Well, there's two issues there. One is how do we get their views expressed, and the other is how do we uh, ensure that everyone who wants to express a view is doing it from an informed point of view. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing I, I really that's want to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk, I think, only a few super diehards cling to some kind of belief that, that there's, there's illegality here, right? I mean, at least in terms of, the, the, of our current you know, U.S. legal system. It's, 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 the legality has been established over mm -hmm. and over and over again. But if you want to say, okay, notwithstanding all of that, it's still the wrong thing to do because of some higher truth or community relations, then, okay, fire, if you want to talk about that, but let's make sure that, that you understand the costs and benefits that you're trading off here and not, taking, not sort of making some kind of knee-jerk reaction, uh, well-intentioned, but ill-informed. Well, let's, let's and that's take what, that. That's what I would like to, above all else here, say, okay, if you think that astronomy in general is, was a bad idea, that they shouldn't have put telescopes on mountaintops, it just was a bad idea, and it never should have, then let's have that conversation and see what, if you've really thought about the, the costs and the benefits. If you think astronomy is okay, but maybe not TMT, that's a different point of view, and that's a different conversation we can have. But you need to know where a person's coming from before you can have a meaningful dialogue and to know what I think at least should be the things they take into account in forming their opinion. I, th I think you, your views uh, represent the views of many people, actually. Um, I think there's been um, you know, a very articulate um, uh, advocacy against the TMT. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there are, you know, well, a couple of days ago, there were 2,000 people there. That means yeah. something. Now it was less, 1,500 or so. Mm -hmm. I think every state uh, enforcement agency is involved, standing by, sometimes making arrests. Um, I think uh, a number of politicians, both state and federal, uh, both Hawaii-centric and on the mainland who yeah. don't know too much about Hawaii, have made statements. And most of that actually has been in opposition to the TMT. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, let me, let me assume for the rest of our show, we have okay. four minutes left, um, that just the ghost of Christmas future here mm -hmm. is that despite the Supreme Court decisions, despite the law, the rule of law, as it exists uh, for this case, yeah. um, you know, the, this decision is at, at great risk right now mm -hmm. because there are so many people who oppose it and they oppose it for religious reasons. And even if those reasons were actually considered in the Supreme Court's action, doesn't matter because they're, mm -hmm. they're articulate and they're strong and they're making their point in, with the media and with so many politicians. So let's assume for this discussion that it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. That TMT is blocked and the people who would like to see it happen, they're okay. on the sideline, they don't say anything. So we have a process by which the, the, the loudest voice is the one that rules 
mm -hmm. and it rules through the media rather than a political vote of any kind. Uh, and we don't have, let's assume for this discussion, we don't have DMT. Oh. It's the ghost of Christmas future, Charles Dickens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to science? What happens to the economy? What happens to jobs? What happens to the social framework of our state? Anybody want to talk about that? Well, on, on the science, uh, assuming that, that uh, the alternate site is actually available and feasible, and I think that's not 100% certain, um, then uh, most of the science gets done on the Canary Island. Okay? But that's, that's only 7,000 feet. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, why, that's, why, that's, that's why I said, feet, that's yeah. why I said most. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The main takeaway point I'd like to make is that the 30-meter telescope offers the people of Hawaii a tremendous opportunity to have one of the world's finest, biggest, most impressive scientific facilities here in Hawaii on a neighbor island, essentially in their backyard, mm. right? And that brings with it incredible opportunities for the young people in Hawaii who are interested in science and technology fields, right? That to me is the biggest benefit of the 30 meter telescope to the people of Hawaii. And if you, after thinking it all over, say, what? No, we don't want that. We want to tell our young people that there's no future if you're interested in those kind of things. If you want to do those kind of things, you're probably going to have to move somewhere else. So and that's, uh, to me, that is the message that they're sending. Yeah. And I would ask them, okay, suppose you win this battle of uh, social media and so on, and you, and you chase the telescope away. How are you really any better off? How does that do anything really to advance the cause, of the legitimate concerns of Native Hawaiians? You get a symbolic victory. You get to cheer for a while. But at the end of the day, did you honestly say that you're that much better off? What are you going to do? How is this actually going to improve the status of Native Hawaiians where you have chased away this opportunity, you've chased away the young people that would have been involved in this, your children and grandchildren are going to be on the mainland or somewhere else? That's what I'd like to hear them explain. What do you got to offer in exchange for giving up this opportunity? Well, uh, there was an article, uh, Lee Cataluna, this morning, mm -hmm. newspaper, and one of the things uh, that was um, interesting there, she was quoting some of the lawyers involved, I guess, and she, she quoted the thought that um, this is actually a, a proxy argument, and that the real problem is not about the telescope. It's about the feelings of the Native yeah. Hawaiian people in but general, how they've been treated since the overthrow. Um, and I think, you know, How can this we is, go back in the past and yeah. make reparation? Is this the way when we don't have a future to explore and discover? I always felt I was so proud of being from Hawaii because we always are known for exploration and discovery. But now I feel like we can't even be pro that anymore because we're looking in the past. We can't make up for what's happened in the past. Nothing can. But we can look to the future and learn from the past. Is there something wrong with that? Is there just going to be a schism and we lose? We all in the, are in the schism and we all lose. That's how I feel right now. Bob, we only have a, oh, we're almost out of time. Okay. So I want to offer you the opportunity to close on this. What would you like to leave with the people who watch? Uh, what message would you like to give? And, and we, you were talking about, you know, being fully informed and mm -hmm. people should know more and know enough to make a, an informed decision, what would you stress on informing them? Well, it's simply what I just said, that, that there are, this is a tremendous opportunity. It's not going to come around again. And so if people are going to oppose the, I mean, if they're opposed to telescopes in general on top of mountains, then fine. I mean, that's a position, it's certainly not one I agree with. Uh, but in the case of the 30, if they are in favor, but against the PMT, then why, do, why would they want to give up on this opportunity, and what do they offer the young people of Hawaii who, in, in return? Um, astronomers are, in general, are very supportive of the many legitimate uh, concerns uh, of Native Hawaiians. They're not at all, 
And I also say that most astronomers actually have quite a strong, well, not just astronomers, but everyone who works on the mountain, have a strong reverence for the mountain, a spirituality uh, associated with it. Spirituality is an individual thing, but uh, I, I know virtually everyone that I work with has a, an attachment to the mountain, not the same as Native Hawaiians, I understand that, but it's still a strong emotional and spiritual uh, mm. contact with mm. that it's mountain. It's a sacred mountain to not only Hawaiians, but to mm. people around the world and to the people who work there. It's a thin place in yeah. the Celtic tradition, if you're familiar with that <laughs> term. <laughs> I don't want to make a pun, but the stakes are really high. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and one of the things that I get from this discussion uh, is that if we don't have TMT, uh, the scientific consortia involved are going to be reluctant to try this again. I They've spent 15 you. years yeah. without a benefit and spent a lot of money trying to get where we are. Uh, all legitimate, crossing every you know, T and dotting every I. Um, Wall Street is not going to invest. The astronomical community is, is going to have to look elsewhere. Because if you knock off TMT, what happens with the next telescope? There won't be a next telescope. It will change Hawaii's connection with astronomy. Yeah. And that That's certainly will true. Be, it will be a radioactive issue politically, and it will be permanent in mm -hmm. our lifetime. Yep. Thank you, Bob. You're quite welcome. Bob McLaren, thank you. Holly Lindsay, yeah. thank you so much for this discussion. Okay. Aloha.